evening folks deadly snake bite bill here this evening to talk about something near and dear that's the deadly snake well I say near and dear I like to see them from a really big distance because I don't even like garden hoses that look like snakes unfortunately uh, I've had to be around a few when I didn't want to be, but I've never been bitten, which is very fortunate. The first snake I want to talk about, and you notice I have here the lethal cobras. Beware of the deadly snake bite. We're going to talk about the cobra snake, the Shelby cobra mustang, and the Bell Helicopter, the AH-1 Cobra. So, the Cobra actually is of any various species of highly venomous snakes most of which expand the neck ribs to form a hood. That's really when they're angry at you. While the hood is characteristic of cobras, not all of them are closely related. Cobras are found from Southern Africa through Southern Asia to islands of Southeast Asia. Throughout the range, different species are favorites of snake charmers who frighten them into assuming the upward defense posture. The snake sways in response to the movement and perhaps also to the music of the charmer. Who knows how to avoid the relatively slow strike and who may have removed the snake's fangs? The short fangs at the front of the mouth have an enclosed groove which delivers the venom. Cobra venom generally contains neurotoxins that are active against the nervous system of prey, primarily small vertebrates and other snakes. Bites, particularly from larger species, can be fatal depending on the amount of venom injected. Neurotoxins affect breathing, and although antivenin is effective, it must be administered soon after the bite. Thousands of deaths occur each year in South and Southeast Asia. The world's largest venomous snake is the King Cobra, found predominantly in forests from India through Southeast Asia to the Philippines and Indonesia. It preys chiefly on other snakes. Maximum confirmed length is 18 feet but most do not exceed 12 feet. That's good to know. King Cobras guard a nest of 20 to 40 eggs, which are laid in a mound of leaves gathered by the female. The guarding parent will strike if a predator or a person approaches too closely. Not all Cobras are egg layers. The Indian Cobra, or Indian Spectacle Cobra, was formerly considered a single species with much the same distribution as the king cobra. Recently, however, biologists have discovered that nearly a dozen species exist in Asia, some being venom spitters and other not. They vary both in size and in the toxicity of their venom. Spitters propel venom through the fangs by muscular contraction of the venom ducts and by forcing air out of the single lung. Uh, you know, for example, you know, we hear a lot about the Mozambique spitting cobra. And on the first slide, the title slide, there was a spitting cobra there. In Africa, there are also spitting and non-spitting cobras, but the African cobras are not related to the Asian cobras, nor are they related to each other. Well, 
the ringhouse or spinning cobra of southern Africa and the black necked cobra, a small form widely distributed in Africa, are spitters. Venom is accurately directed at the victim's eyes at distances of more than two meters and may cause temporary or even permanent blindness unless promptly washed away. The Egyptian cobra, probably the asp of antiquity, is a dark, narrow-hooded species about two meters long that ranges over much of Africa and eastward to Arabia. Its usual prey consists of toads and birds. In equatorial Africa, there are tree cobras, which along with the mambas are the only arboreal members of the family Elapidae. That is really good to know. And just to finish up here, the fact that they do belong to this group of snakes called elipids, the group also includes sea snakes, coral snakes, mambas, and crates. Uh, the interesting thing, I also use the name sand crate on some of my usernames on different, uh, different accounts. I was sitting in front of my bunker in Vietnam along the river where I already knew he didn't want to go down the brush along the river because that's where I first ever saw a cobra in real life. But the sand crates were there. And so I'm leaning against the bunker, tap, 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 tap on my boot. Well, here was a sand crate. Well, you know, if I wanted him to bite me, I would have had to spread my fingers and get him right there, and then I would have died. So, the sand crates, yellow-bellied sea snake, uh, coral snake, all those guys are related to the cobra in the venom department. All right, moving right along talk about the Ford Mustang Cobra. You know, originally, Carroll Shelby took an AC Bristol and put a little Ford V8 in it and raced it at Le Mans. When they were done racing, it was going to cost like 4000 bucks or something, something in that area to ship the cars back to the U.S., so he's he just sold them there for that. $4,000 for an AC Cobra. Hoo-wee. Uh, they go for a lot more at the auction. That's for sure. So that was the, the first Cobra was the AC Bristol with a V8 engine in it. Now, the Ford Mustang Cobra history is closely, closely intertwined with that of the Shelby Mustang. Both the Shelby and Cobra represent the pinnacle of Mustang performance. It was Carroll Shelby, not Ford Motor Company, who first used the name Cobra on a car. Shelby Americans AC Cobras were the perfect mix of a lightweight European sports car and American V8 power. They could blaze around corners offering tight handling at incredible speeds. Now, Carol Shelby has passed on, and I don't know if their plant in Henderson, Nevada is still in business or not. I had a Shelby Mustang Cobra that came out of the Henderson plant while he was still alive. But they sold what was called a continuation series uh, AC Cobra, and you could buy it with uh, a huge uh, choice of drivetrains, Ford, of course. Then there were all sorts of other Cobra kit cars, Factory 5, and then there were ones made in South Africa that came in completed, except for the drivetrain. So 
Cobra, AC Cobra looking car was a very, very popular uh, car. And so were the uh, continuation series. When the economy took a real nosedive, oh my gosh, about the time that uh, Obama got elected, I saw advertised two Shelby continuation series rollers. That meant there was no transmission engine, whatever, for $65,000 each. Man, I wish I'd have had the money. All right. When Shelby began creating the GT350, many of the parts had the Cobra logo on them since they were made in the same shop as the Cobras. Many people started using the terms Shelby and Cobra, Cobra interchangeably. Unfortunately, that's where some of the confusion occurred. When Shelby briefly left the world of fast cars, he assumed there would be no more Shelbys or Cobras. But Ford really liked the Cobra name. While they couldn't make Shelbys without Carroll Shelby, they didn't see why they couldn't make Cobras. The resulting legal dispute is most likely why Shelby worked with Dodge during the 80s and 90s. A little bit of a look at the history of the Cobra from its early Shelby roots to the rebirth in uh, 1993 that has lasted off and on until modern times. Uh, you can buy a GT500 supercharged for high dollars if you really want one. Many of the great Shelby Mustangs from the AC Cobra through the GT500 are mistakenly grouped with Ford's line of Cobras. This is because they originated the Cobra badge, later used in Mustang Cobras. But the Mustang Cobra is considered a separate line that began with the Mustang II. They had a very different design compared to the Shelby models. While the Shelby GT500 was designed in conjunction with the SVT, licensing remained separate, so the two cars still battle it out on the roads for who is the king of snakes. Now the SVT Cobra special vehicle team uh, through the Shelby's or though the Shelby's have returned to the Mustang world it's unlikely that we'll see the return of the SVT Cobra again. The Cobras were a great stand-in to the Shelby Mustang. However, the GT350 and GT500 high-performance models based on the first-gen Mustang are popular with enthusiasts. It's possible that future Mustang generations may see a resurgence in Cobra-based editions, but with Super Snakes slithering around, there hasn't been much of a demand. While the rebirth of the Cobra may be wishful thinking, the popularity and nostalgia make the Cobra SVT a possibility for the future, which it has reemerged from time to time. The 1999 Cobra Mustang was actually only sold until August 6, 99, when Ford recalled all 8,000 and 95 units sold. The Cobra wasn't reaching the horsepower promised, so the production of the SVT halted into 2001. While redesigning the 99 SVT, Ford pushed ahead with its 2000R model and created 300 cars with a 385 horsepower V8. And that was 2001, and the market returned with 7,251 cars. The 2001 SVT Cobra was largely a fixed version of the 99 model. There were a few changes in the engine block, a series of cosmetic differences. The rear bumper now featured Cobra lettering instead of Mustang. A nice addition to the Cobras in the new millennium was an improved intake manifold and exhaust. 
These upgrades allowed it to meet emission standards that were starting to pop up in the U.S. All right, they had another series, the SN95, uh, that uh, were brought out. The 95 stood out with its special option of a removable hard top, a convertible with an upgrade to hold a fiberglass top and reattach a dome light. Both coupes and convertibles were available in 94 and 95. The 95 also had an R option with a 5.8 liter V8 and 300 horsepower. Again, the R option nixed fancy things like air conditioning, power windows, and fog lights. Only 250 of these R models were made. Ford made 6,009 Cobra Mustangs in 1994 and dropped production to just 5,258 in 1995. However, a big increase in production took place in 1996 with 10,003 Mustangs created. When interest peaked in 97, production jumped up to 10,049 before falling down to 8,654 in 1998. Now, Ford's special vehicle team began producing the SVT Cobra in 93. Uh, the SVT Cobra stepped on the gas three times during its life cycle with the Cobra R variants. The SVT Cobras were crafted from 93 to 2004. Compared to the other Mustangs, the SVTs were powerful beasts that came in a relatively limited quantity. They were produced for collectors as much as for racers. Some R models even required the owner to have a racing license to buy the car. Uh, the first SVT Cobra made its debut at the 1992 Chicago Auto Show, highlighting the abilities of the SVT. While the exterior was like the 93 Mustang GT, the Cobra's fangs were nestled squarely beneath the hood. To kick off its first year of a new Cobra, Ford also created an R model of the 1993 SVT Cobra. This racing variant only came in vibrant red and focused on speed and power with improved brakes. It also featured a cooler for the engine, power steering, and improved wheels. I've actually got a set of the center plugs for Cobra R, you know, the black with the, the, the red R on them. Those are hard to find. These are real from Ford. They're not eBay specials from China. On January 17th, 2019, a 1993 Cobra R sold for $132,000 out the door price at the Barrett Jackson auction, setting a record price for the Fox Body Cobra Mustangs. This particular Cobra was pristine with just over 500 miles, so it may be some time before that record is broken. Well, that's enough on the car. Let's go to the helicopter. I loved that helicopter. We uh, absolutely, because in Vietnam, the North Vietnamese Army owned the night. We were up near the DMZ in Quang Tri. And when a cobra would show up and start working out firing rockets, we felt a little more comfortable that the North Vietnamese Russian-made rockets wouldn't be coming in and landing in our fuel dump or with delayed fuses going through the roofs of our bunkers. The AH-1 Cobra was developed in the mid-60s as an interim gunship for the U.S. Army for use during the Vietnam War. 
The Cobra shared the proven transmission rotor system and the T53 turbo shaft engine of the UH-1 Huey. By June 67, the first AH-1G Huey Cobras had been delivered. Bell built 1116 AH-1Gs for the U.S. Army between 1967 and 1973. And the Cobras chalked up over a million operational hours in Vietnam. The U.S. Marine Corps was very interested in the H-1G Cobra, but it preferred a twin-engine version for improved safety and overwater operations, and also wanted a more potent turret-mounted weapon. At first, the Department of Defense balked at providing the Marines with a twin-engine version of the Cobra, in the belief the commonality with Army AH-1Gs outweighed the advantages of a different engine fit. However, the Marines won out and awarded Bell a contract for 49 twin-engine AH-1J Sea Cobras in May of 68. As an interim measure, the U.S. Army passed on 38 AH-1Gs to the Marines in 1969. The H-1J also received a more powerful gun turret. It featured a three-barrel, 20-millimeter XM-197 cannon based on the six-barrel M-61 Vulcan cannon. So, just for grins, the single-engine Cobra was the AH-1G and the AH-1Q and they had an AH-1S, a P, an E, and an F and other single engine variants. Now, you can look up the Bell AH-1 Cobra and notice that they were sold to other countries, uh, the variants. All right, the one AH-1J was the original twin-engine version. We had a, and that was the C Cobra, we had an AH-1J International that was exported, uh, an export version of the AH-1J C Cobra. We had an AH-1T Improved C Cobra with an extended tail boom and upgraded transmission and engines. Then the AH-1 Whiskey Super Cobra, day-night version with more powerful engine and advanced weapons capability, the minigun on the chin. It's a really very, very uh, uh, bad boy. That's all you can say. They came out with the four-bladed Whiskey test version with four-bladed bearingless composite main rotor based on the Bell 680 rotor. A prototype was converted from AH-1T. Then we had the latest in the line of Cobras, the AH-1Z Viper. The new variant nicknamed Zulu Cobra and developed in conjunction with the UH-1Y Venom for the H1 upgrade program and adds the target site system. So there's a interesting history on that helicopter, which uh, is a, um, it's something to see when it's doing its thing in the air against the enemy. I renamed my channel as the Deadly Snake Bite channel. You may ask why. Okay, I'll tell you. Number one is that I've seen a cobra in the wild. Vietnam, of course. Number two is that a cobra shed his skin between the sandbags where I was fortunately, get me, fortunately sound asleep.
Vietnam, of course. He must have slithered over the top of me. We found an eight foot long skin stuck at the rear end between the sandbags and the rest of it draped across the lower part of me. <sighs> and that couldn't have been anything but a cobra because we had cobras down over the bank near the river. All right, that should be enough cobra stories. However, I was stationed at Marble Mountain, Vietnam, for a little while in Vietnam, and that was when the Marine Corps took delivery of some AH-1G cobras. It was exciting to see these bad boys fly and eventually see them working out when I was back up in Quang Tri, Vietnam, of course. To finish the saga, I've owned a Shelby Cobra Mustang and a Ford SVT Cobra. I also have a skill model radio controlled AH-1S Cobra helicopter that is shown right here. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Just call me Deadly Snakebite. I really like that name. After all, at 76 years old, I can be anybody that I want to be, especially on the internet. So I'm going to say Semper Fly. <laughs>